Welcome. Tonight on The Breakdown, we have waited all season for a golden point finish. Then two in less than 24 hours. Yes, two extra time absolute thrillers, but at what cost? The All Black Triage unit is looking pretty full. We can't wait to climb into a super weekend of super footy with you. Plus, Tabs climbs into some of the new rules, but is everyone on board? That's all ahead tonight on The Breakdown. Kia ora koutou katoa, hello and welcome to The Breakdown. Yes, Sky Super Rugby Aotearoa served up our first taste of Golden Point footy on the weekend and both the Chiefs and Crusaders answered the call and both secured the critical victories for the Highlanders and the Hurricane. It almost certainly ended their title ambitions. We welcome in, as always, our viewers in South Africa on Super Sport and Australia on stand. Sir John Kerwin, Mills Muliaina and Ricky Swinnell on my team tonight. Bernie, of course, Tabai a little bit later on. Ricky, welcome on board. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, doesn't look like a circus at all around here. No, I'm completely relaxed. No idea what's going on, but we'll be all we're, right. We're well and truly on top of things tonight. <laughs> JK, let's start on a sombre note, though. We look around around New Zealand and we still have the luxury of playing in front of crowds. Italy are hopefully still on track to come here and play against the All Blacks middle of the season, but Italian rugby lost a couple of real heroes to their game in recent days. Yes, yeah, sad morning uh, for, for rugby in Italy this morning, but also uh, for me, Massimo Cotita was 52 years of age, he was a great, uh, him and his twin brother were great players, you would have remembered them probably from uh, 87 World Cup and uh, he died of COVID so this I can't use the word COVID but what I think of it but really sad day um, still 500 deaths a day in Italy so really difficult over there and Marco Bolazan who was um, my manager when I was coaching there and, and a legend in the game and he uh, he died of old age not of COVID so that was good he was nearly 80 but uh, yeah, so sad day and my uh, thoughts go out to, to uh, both families, sad day. And, and Mills, uh, sometimes we take for granted the fact that we are in a bubble right now uh, here in New Zealand. I mean, we have the luxury and you see other sports across the globe still suffering the fact they can't have fans. We should always cherish every opportunity we get to see our players up close and spend time with their families. Oh, absolutely. And you put it into perspective when you hear stuff like that uh, from JK, the fact that, you know, we, we, we often sort of move on and sort of forget uh, about COVID. Um, and how lucky we actually are to have live sport and be able to attend live so sport. So, you know, we've got to be conscious always that, uh, you know, we're, we're very, very fortunate. Well, what does it all mean from the weekend? The results, how does it play out? What does the table look like? Who's chasing what? Things have got incredibly difficult, virtually impossible for the Hurricanes. The Highlanders need a number of things to go their way in terms of result. They'll have to win their two remaining games. The Blues and Chiefs have a game in hand. The Crusaders just create a little bit of breathing space, but they are not home and hose just yet. Ricky, in terms of securing that home final. And we all know how critical that's going to be for whoever hosts. For whoever. Nobody wants to go down there, do they? Um, but I think we've seen in the last couple of weeks that they are infallible, the, the Crusaders. Yes, the Hurricanes didn't finish them off. The Highlanders did the week before. Hurricanes will be kicking themselves and ruining those missed opportunities. But there are some little holes in the armour. And, of course, the injuries this week, Moody and Goodhue, massive blows if they, look as, if they are as serious as they look to be. JK, is this a point where other teams now have maybe looked at the Crusaders. You're smiling away there, grinning like, <laughs> do you know something? The fact that all of a sudden you're feeling a little bit more confident about the fact that maybe the Blues can get up. Maybe another team could really put pressure on them for hosting this final and maybe change the landscape. Oh, we spoke about scoreboard pressure, right? And it'd be really interesting. I mean, I'm a, I'm a fan for Golden Point, don't get me wrong, but I wonder what a draw, two draws would have done to the competition. Because when you are battling to get somewhere and, and you know, the Hurricanes, they'll be absolutely shattered because they could have stayed in the, in the fight. You know, I just think that what happened in the beginning of this competition was everyone was pretty, oh, this is another season, we've done pre-season. Crusaders, like they do, they just kept smashing on and I just think everyone else picked their game up and have started to go, we need to be really intense and... Yeah, they've worked it out. I think some players under pressure have been left wanting for the Crusaders and they need to take a bit of a look at themselves. You know, there's a couple of players making some errors under pressure, which we don't normally see, but I just think it's from a different intensity that the other teams are bringing, and, and it's great football. Mills, I have one question. The toss happens, and normally the start of a game, no, no big deal, because you've got 80 minutes 
to decide and work out the contest who's going to go on and win. The toss happens in Golden Point. Critical the decisions you make, and the decision of the Hurricanes to play into the wind? Yeah. Yeah, I found that, I mean, Dunedin obviously not, not significant Definitely in terms enough. of the, the roof, but the, the wind was blowing, you know I mean? Even up in the, in the box, and I wondered why that was, you know? Scott Barrett won the, the, won the toss. He, he, he opted, opted for to the kick, kick right? Which was obviously the, they wanted to get down into their 22 and force them to make a mistake. But then Princip actually, you know, wanted to go on the, the side where they were going against the, the wind. I, I don't know, I, I mean... When, when you've got a weapon we who, who was attempting a kick from 65 <laughs> metres in Geordie Barrett, which I really wish had gone over. You know, but Ricky, I mean, for me, right from the very, very start, putting pressure on themselves, that, you know, you don't think about the second half of extra time in Golden Point, you're thinking about how do I score first? And doesn't it go to the show how important we, you know, we hear so much of this new age of leadership groups, and you've got Dane Coles and Artie Savia sitting on the sideline. Who are those? Obviously, no TJ Pedernardi this year. Who is those guys who step up and make those calls? But I think Brad Weber said it to you too from the Chiefs game, didn't really give it much thought of how we play out these Golden Points. All of a sudden, it's here. Yeah, look, I just think they didn't think about it. And that is, they'll be thinking about it from here on out. <laughs> but the, the reality is, I'm with Ricky, it's like, oh, we just didn't consider all the ramifications of Golden Point. You know, you start thinking about, you know, they probably start thinking about the one try or the drop kick, or, but they don't go, oh, let's work for a penalty, or who cares about the win? So they'll, now they do. Yeah, I, and, and, get, and playing for that, I don't think it's too dissimilar, though, to the last five minutes of a normal game, right? Where a game is tied mills, where you're trying to get yourself in a position in which both teams, I think, had an opportunity into need and looking for a drop goal to, to win the contest. So I'm, I'm not necessarily around that, but it looked as though guys didn't, teams didn't give themselves the best chance, whereas to me it looked as though David Harvey and the Crusaders knew exactly where they wanted to be, knew exactly where he wanted to be and how they were going to do it, and the fact they got someone other than their predominantly their main kicker at first five and Richie Mwanga to kick the goal. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously, I mean, they probably would have trained, you know, because when you don't have Richie Mwanga, I mean, he had a shot at it, uh, you know, during their normal play as well, and he missed. But to then go into to, um, golden point time and, and have someone like Harvey Lee step up as well so, and, and, and slot it the way he did. But also the patience in it. You know, they, they looked very patient as soon as that happened, and I suppose that's a big momentum when, you, when you're playing a golden point. But to be able to just then sit back and say, let's be really patient about this and make sure we nail it first time was, was outstanding. Decision making under pressure, right? And it doesn't matter if it's, as you say, last five minutes of a game or if it's golden point. And while, yes, we can see that the Crusaders may have a few faults, what happened still in the end? They found a way to win when other teams didn't. I do think it's different, though, Rick. I think it's completely different psych. The golden I, point yeah, psych? Golden po I think the golden point is going to be something special, and it's a completely different I, I think there's a whole lot of people that would be disappointed in the final whistle and sort of drop themselves mentally relax I, th I think there was a couple of errors that I saw from tiredness I mean for me it's just a whole different part of the game which I really enjoy execution though you think uh, Joshua Wani Downs and Eden had plenty of time and, and he'll be disappointed he missed their chance uh, for the Hurricanes look have they been as bad as their record reflects, the fact they've been in games, they've had opportunities, or is this just a case where, look, they've tried another first five, Ruben Love got his chance on the weekend, I thought did pretty well considering, but they just haven't quite found their feet yet, and, and their ability, I suppose, to coordinate all the talent they seem to have on the on the park. Oh, and don't get me wrong, you know, that combination, nine and ten, is, is crucial, isn't it? And, you know, Ruben Love played... You know, he had a great start to the game, you know, he pounced on a ball that's, you know, with a, um, you know, a bit of bravery, but... I actually thought the Hurricanes, you know, looked after him very well as well. You know, Geordie Barrett stepped up and he controlled a lot of that game. And sort of, so just left the youngster just to sort of get into his running game, which we all know he's good at. You know, he's always, already mentioned he's a, you know, he'd love to play fullback. So it just frees his mind up. He doesn't have to think too much. And then you see guys like, you know, Lol Mape. To answer your question about the um, the Hurricanes, are they as bad as what what, what the, the scoreboard seems? I don't think so. You know, they played very well. They, they were very direct earlier on. Geordie Barrett, um, uh, I thought, was, was outstanding. Artie Saar there. How good. How good. He was, out, he was amazing. And so, uh, but also goes to show how close this competition is. To, to your point, JK, how, how fast our teams actually adapt. You know, the Crusaders go out and they, they blow everyone away in the first you know, uh, few rounds. But how, how, how fast has our teams been able to adapt to get themselves now to the Crusader level? And this is a conversation that we had last year around the Chiefs. Very much the same situation, right? They weren't able to find way to, ways to win games, but they're in contests for a long, long period of time. Well, in 2021, we have changed a number of things in and around the game. Tabai Matson is going to join me now. And Tabs, let's talk about the fact that in the last 20 years, we continue to tinker with yeah. the game. We changed the game. We've introduced new things in 2021. Absolutely. And every, every off-season is filled with for the players, the coaches and the referees an adjustment in some manner. 
And sometimes for the fans, it takes three or four games to kind of let that unfold and let the, the game get the rhythm. And so when you look at those laws, how does that affect teams and players? And you think about the major adjustments players are having to make from year to year. Yeah. Well, it, it's, a, it's a tough one, but it also shows you how far the game's gone. So, I mean, when we bring this footage up of the Italy-England game, it was only a couple of years ago that um, this was legal. Um, the Chiefs in 12 and 13, you saw Liam Messam doing this, understanding that the, you know, offside line isn't formed until a ruck is formed, and people were standing legally in the wrong pate. You know, and World Rugby come in, they adjust the laws, we adjust again, and it takes a while for us to kind of get into the rhythm of the game. Yeah. And so you talk about the things we've changed this season yeah. and all of a sudden the introduction of a goal line drop it. How has that affected the competitions across here and the Tasman? Yeah, so the guys at Vanguard had a look at last year's competition with Australia and also the last eight years of scrums, five metre attacking scrums in particular. And you can see there, there's not that much change, so there's pretty much one, one goal line drop out in Australia and we're at 0.7, but it'll probably end up at one. Um, and on the back of that, it's achieved what we thought it was going to achieve, which was fewer scrums more ball and play, uh, more running rugby. And so in regards to that, then you look about the teams that have taken advantage of that, and when we're talking about counter-attack, and yeah. you're talking about getting opportunities and teams that are used to taking advantage of field position, yeah. who suffered the most? Well, the team that suffered the most is the Crusaders. Wow. So, you know, for them, this has really blunted a big part of their game. Um, and also the Blues, who are pretty good in that part of the part of the. Uh, that part of the field, and it's clearly easier to score, a, you know, points from a from a five metre scrum than it is from a, a receiving the ball from halfway. And one of the things you'll see this year, like they've had six goal line dropouts. Now, if this was um, in previous years, six, uh, sorry, six scrums on the five metre, they would have scored an excess of 15 points, being conservative. This year, they've received six goal line dropouts. They've netted minus two points. So a significant change in, in what they bring to the game, but they seem to find a way, don't they? Well, and, and is that they presented opportunities for the opposition? Are, we, are you surprised at the fewest number of having of goal and dropouts? Do you think we will see more? A little, I think when you look at the Australian game, they probably kick the ball a little bit more in the red zone. We're a little bit more roll your arms up and just hold onto the ball and look for a penalty and maybe uh, muscle your way over the line. So we probably don't put the ball into the end zone. But the Crusaders get into your red zone often. Yeah. And on the back of that, they're getting more goal line dropouts, which is not ideal for them. That's across the competition. Mm. The referees have looked at a number of things this year. One of those has been players advancing in front of the kicker. Since the beginning of time, you've had to be put on side when a kick is behind you. And just watch here. And people have said to me, oh, this has no impact on the game. This is a defensive line. Yeah. Bottom line, it does impact the game <laughs> if guys are offside and advance. The, the ball is one away from the ball. If you know, The game is one away from the ball. So all the stuff around the ball um, has a massive impact. Uh, if someone catches the ball in the, in the backfield and the chase line's five metres closer, that is absolutely going to impact the decision they make to run or kick. And that's about space and it's about time and we want to see counter-attack. And it wasn't the only game, Tabs, on the weekend where that happened. It happened down in Dunedin as well. And JK, the fact the referees, they came together, they talked at the start of the season about a number of areas they were going to focus on on the weekend. Did you think they had a good or bad game? I thought it was been a Keith Beth game for 18 months. I thought he uh, refed with personality and he didn't seem to be worried about anything. I thought Paul Williams also was really well played uh, refereed exceptionally well. Why? I don't know. I mean, you need to talk to Polly and Bryce. Apparently they're in Taupo, so maybe they just left them alone and let them... <laughs> and go uh, about their business? Yeah, they're at, uh, you know, at the Hobbs tournament, and so maybe they just let them do what they need to do, and I think it's important. I've always said that refs need to ref with a personality. There's lots of rules, and Tabs, it's a really interesting conversation. When do we just leave these rules and say, let's stick with what we've got for a few years and just let everyone adapt? Because every year there seems to be those things that that uh, we have to adapt to. So the referees are an important part of our game, and, and I think it, when they're on their game, it's... And they speed it up, Goldie, something that you and, and absolutely love to hate. Yeah. So speed it up a bit, and I think we need to add a couple of things that aren't rules, but you've got 30 seconds to set your scrum and do it. You've got 45 seconds to kick and get it, throw them in, and just speed them up so there's a bit more fatigue, you know? Real, uh, Ricky, the... For, for me, what was really relevant uh, when I think about those games is the fact afterwards, both coaches and both players accepted that they were responsible. Yep. 
That's a massive step forward, <laughs> really, right? And saying, you know what, it's on us to adapt. Well, the Mitch Brown one a couple of times wasn't, and that was the really clear one about the not advancing, and, and I know we talked about it in-game at the time. That is the rule, and he knows that. So just stop. And he adjusted, and that's all you had to do. Ben O'Keefe was really clear, as you said, um, JK, about making that point known. I think you're right. I think, are we trying to make an imperfect game perfect all the time? And it's just not possible with the amount of rules in it. But I like the idea. Speed things up and put a shot clock on for a scrum reset and liven things up a bit, a little bit that way so people in the stadium might know what's going on a little bit more as well. But yeah, that would I bet. That the game is, is far from perfect. Yeah. So let's stop trying to make it that way. Getting the right calls, yes, but every little thing. Um, and refs aren't perfect either. Absolutely. So just let them be themselves. Let them tend towards how they want to ref. If someone's you know, more diligent on coming in from the side, or at least the, the, the coaches will study them, they'll know what they what they sort of cover and, and we'll be fine. Mills. Let them grow long hair to get them a mullet like, <laughs> like Halligan used to have in the rugby league. They're superstars, mate. Let's not, Pink boots, Let's not Mills. go too far. Let's not go too far. <laughs> Mills, let's not go too far. But in terms of the context of the game, uh, Tony Brown has already come out and said, come out and said he thought his team was soft. Uh, they missed a number of opportunities. Really difficult, challenging night for Mitch Hunt. The fact to go playing the perfect game, yeah. but all of a sudden things didn't quite go well, uh, well enough for him on the weekend, and they missed chances. The Highlanders, they'll be kicking themselves because realistically, this was their chance to get back in this competition. Oh, it's interesting. Also, he said what, what's how young his team is as well. So I, I think what he actually means is young in terms of you've got to bring the intensity once again you know you can't sort of just be reliant um, to do that one week and then sort of you know button off a little bit and that's where the, the, um, the Chiefs actually got them and I think that's probably what's made Brownie a little bit frustrated the fact that they they weren't quite there in terms of the phys physical battle which you know often has been their um, you know, what they did against the Crusaders is what won them the game they, they got up there they beat them up physically and they didn't they didn't quite nail that against the Chiefs they win a game they lose a game don't they they win a game they lose a game well, I'm going to remember happens. that from a tipping comp <laughs> yeah, okay, really they win yeah. a game or lose no, a game no, alright no, so no, I should, should be all over it are you expecting them though to play the role of spoiler, spoiler now well uh, they've shown that they're capable of doing it right like they did it against the Crusaders they, they too have got now got some injury problems perhaps with Putty Putty Parkinson as well they're not out of it although Tony Brown saying that perhaps they are I think that's more to give his team a bit of a rocket to front up again next week because he knows they can do it. It must be infuriating to go from that to that. Yeah, and look, they haven't played that well at home for a while. That, that, I think that really eight, frustrates them. Yeah. Really frustrates them, JK. But I'd say there's still those little things, and we've talked about Brownie. And look, I think we'll give a lot of uh, credit to a Clark Dermody when it comes to line out moves. And, uh, you know, there were some moments of brilliance in this game, Mills. Mm -hmm. And for me, this was certainly one of them when you see something that's formulated, a perfect decoy creates a perfect mm -hmm. opportunity. Oh, it was amazing, wasn't it? And, and well set up. But also, you've got to remember, it's got to be the personnel. You know, having um, Frizzell there and run that decoy runner, you know, he's going to attract people because he's been a great ball runner, he's big and physical, and he's probably been their most dominant ball carrier. And so that's what, what sort of gave it away for, for Webby. He, he had to go, actually go there and consider him, which opened it up. So it's not just about coming up with the move. You've got to have certain amount, certain people in, in, in certain roles to be able to pull it off. And that's what the Highlanders did well, which I thought was outstanding. They'll come up with something. They'll have to come up with something to take on a Blues team that know well and truly that they are going to be challenged when they come down Burn, I'm going to bring you back in because we're going to bring back something we've had in the past. We're seeing it more and more now, and we always want to focus on our community game. Absolutely, Jeff. But first, can we can we clip up JK saying, can refs please just be themselves and ref the way they want to? You've had the quinoa salad and the mankini call, but that is just the best. Let refs ref the way they want to. Let them be themselves. I'll buy them orange can we clip boots. Clip that up now. I'll buy them orange boots. Love it. Make them heroes. Yes, the local community, Jeff. We are firing back up a really an oldie but a goodie. But like ourselves, really. Local hero segment. We can't do it without you, though. Let us know about someone on your team or club who deserves a shout out. Email us at thebreakdown.co.nz. We'd love to share their contribution and acknowledge them. We look forward to it. Here's a taste of just how we do it. I may not see it on my face, but I do enjoy coaching these kids. Um, seeing them grow as not just players, but as individuals. How he finds their energy is beyond me. Yeah, sometimes I do feel burnt out. Like now, I just want to go home and have a sleep, but yeah, I've got to go to Mahi soon. <laughs> so I've been a police officer for just over six years and loving every minute of it. We get to be, once again, that role model for kids to look up to. That's part of the job that I enjoy, breaking down those barriers and being able to communicate with people. You two will be my first pullover. <laughs> Where'd you guys get your money for that truck? Tetekos are a low socioeconomic area. 
um, predominantly gang based and with that being mongrel mob, it is a mongrel mob stronghold. There's a lot of kids around here that I know can be productive members of the community and all they need is they're pushing the right direction. I was really excited when I had the opportunity. Obviously coming from Sevens, I um, thought it was just another opportunity to play rugby and come and I guess try and you know push other girls and um, yeah showcase you know 15s but on the Sevens field. I don't want to close my doors for Sevens so coming out here just means you know you're showcasing what you've got and hopefully just improved. We've been playing against ourselves now for the last year really and beating each other up so something different and we wanted to be challenged. You know, we're probably one of the smallest teams on the World Series and you know, we wanted a physical battle and they certainly gave us that so it was brilliant. We wanted to give them a bit of a test, so we've decided to like you know chuck one of our props in, like a couple of our loose boards, um, just to give them something different. So we were kind of trying to play more of a direct game rather than the like just the whip game that they're used to. We tried to implement a little bit of pod work, so kind of like our 15s, bring our 15 skills into the sevens game. We did a little bit, kind of worked out for us, so it's good to change things up for them as well. An opportunity too to get our Pacific uh, Moana team involved. You know, they don't get this opportunity at all. And then our Black Queens 15s that have, that have had a real cup postponed, so an opportunity for them to come and play. It's exciting when you know we come and verse the Black Ferns who've been doing this forever, and we've just got a little team that just met each other two weeks ago. So it is exciting. It gives everyone an opportunity. And yeah, we're just thriving off this week. It's been an amazing experience. Like we are the first women to wear this, this jersey, Moana Pacifica, and the build up towards the weekend has been amazing. You know, we've got amazing people coming in, sharing their stories, word of encouragement, and just the story behind Moana Pacifica. You can now say that we are the OGs who wore the jersey before <laughs> others, so it's a really cool feeling. <laughs> Next year's going to be a big year, you know, we've got Commonwealth Games, World Cup 7s and 15s, you know, we're going to have to collaborate together. We just wanted to put our best foot forward so that we could give the 7s a run. So I guess this is just New Zealand rugby helping each other and I think it's awesome and hopefully they can repay that favour back to us next year leading into the World Cup. On Wednesday, it is 100 days before the Olympics. So, Ricky, you talk about preparing. It's going to be different for everybody in regards to going to this Olympics, how critical they got started, at least on the weekend. Yeah, completely different. So good to have Sevens back. It was so good at the stadium on Sunday. Like, it just had all, KT and I were like kids in a candy shop having it back. Um, look, for the New Zealand teams, particularly the New Zealand women, there's, there's so much depth within their squad that playing internally against each other is probably not necessarily a bad thing. You know, the USA, Canada, they've been playing in Dubai recently. Hopefully we'll get some international competition against Australia, Fiji, but but the, the depth and the skill and the group of players that have come through in the women's sevens is unbelievable at the moment. And experience, JK, as well, right, is going to be critical in terms of our success because you're not going to have that in-tournament challenge. Yeah, yeah, well, I think we've got the best team. I'm yeah. not worried about that, but it's the lack of that competition or travelling or living in a hotel. I mean, is that going to cost us a medal at the end of no, the day? No, I don't, I don't think it will. They, they are so professional now. Um, that, and, and the Sevens programme have done a really good job. They've put these performance windows in. So everything they did over the weekend, they replicated exactly what they would do at an Olympics or a Commonwealth Games or whatever, what a tournament will be like. They'll get to play Australia, one of their main rivals, you would think. They're going to have a heat training camp in Okinawa before they, before they actually get into Tokyo. So I, I think the quality within that side is so good. Um, um, that that lack of competition isn't so much and bother. I think the other teams would be more worried about them being just tucked down here at the, in the end of the world, um, quietly going about their business. I'll be interested maybe though, Mills, in terms of the unknown about the Olympics itself, in terms of what that's going to look like when you start thinking about how much of a vibrant, energetic place mm -hmm. it is, given the fact that environment they're going to. I think maybe that's when the experience might be critical, is the fact that they are, have that ability to adapt when it's not like they've experienced in the past at a Commonwealth Games before or an Olympics. Yeah, absolutely, and the logistical side 
side of things. You know, they could end up, they don't actually know what they're, they're going to do apart from that camp. You know, they, sh they could end up going to a tournament in Australia and then be away for the whole time. So you've got to actually pick a squad, but also the intensity leading into the, to these tournaments because even though you try and replicate it one week, it's the consistency in it because you've got to actually be able to play that, you know, for another consecutive week and not have sort of big breaks, big bulky breaks before you go into um, to the Olympics. So that's perhaps the worrying part. But I suppose... The, the confidence they have is everyone else is in the same boat. Mm, exactly. And so it's, it's, it's the same for everyone else. Are the men... Well, I'm, I'm just, you're a giveaway. You're a dear giveaway. No, you're either you're happy, you're I'm down, just worried. You're there, I'm worried. You're, you're I'm worried. I'm, I'm less worried now about, you know, the women's sevens, but are the men then worse off? <laughs> if we've got a really deep, you know, women's seven side internal competition, so what about, the, what about the men, Goldie? I mean, are they worse off? Do we need to try and get them on some sort of tour? Oh. Well, well they'll, be, they'll be the same. They'll same. play, they'll go to Australia. I'm presuming they'll go to Australia as well and play Australia, Fiji, which, you know, that's as, as good as you can get. The Samoa side that the men played over the weekend, the Samoa Barbarians, is pretty much that yeah. Samoa national team. So they've got some really good options there. And they showed some, some good depth the other day, the men as well, over yeah. the weekend. So, Internal um, competition's yeah. never a problem no. when it comes to the men's. And they get a couple well. of games to have a look at the opposition when they get to the Olympics anyway. So, yeah, I'm quietly confident. Is, Don't say it too loud, though. Yeah, just over 100 days. We'll continue to watch this speech. Burn is going to come back now, and she's going to go with our burn around the globe, and it been, uh, begins across the ditch. Let's get our points up, shall we? You go know, on. we've got three rounds remaining, plus, of course, a final. But um, the Aussies, they have been found. They're finalists, all good to go. The Brumbies, though, they'll have to go behind enemy lines to defend their crown with the grand final showdown, Brisbane bound. The Queensland Reds finishing at the top of the table after beating the Brumbies in a two-point thriller on Saturday. All right, what's a former Wallaby, Matt Gitto, doing these days? Well, he's living in America, playing in the Major League Rugby Comp. He's first five for his Los Angeles side. So how's he doing? He's getting smashed. Uh, this is uh, not great quality picture, but that is quite the picture, isn't it? Uh, it's the US, they said, land of gridiron and ice hockey and baseball. How hard could it be? Uh, yeah, in typical ghetto fashion, he's basically owning it. He's saying he bounced back, didn't feel a thing. You're right. Well, reports that three of Warren Gatlin's coaching staff have bailed on the British and Irish Lions head coach. Uh, not unusual, but there are conflicting reports in the British media. The Times Sport says, believe it. Telegraph Sport says, rubbish. It's understood that Andy Farrell, Steve Borthwick and Graham Roundtree have all said no to the tour. It's so far been plagued with logistical headaches thanks to COVID, but the new issues may be with personnel. And wouldn't you know it, waiting in the wings, ready to throw a bit of gasoline on the chatter, Eddie Jones. He's thrown this name into the mix, John Mitchell. Current England defence coach and former All Black coach. Could he slot in? Well, on the factual side of the story, Gatland has yet to select his touring squad due to hit South Africa in July. Well, England have booked the first spot in the Women's Six Nations final. They ran in nine tries to bury Italy. Sorry, JK. 67 points to three. The English wore black armbands, paying tribute and respect to the late Prince Philip. Their opponents will be known next week after the win of the Ireland-France match is found. Well, back home and all black selectors may be looking for some new recruits. The extra time thriller in Wellington took its toll on both sides. Hardy Savia... Well, well, he was held together by strapping tape as it looked at the end, but, you know, Artie, he just keeps going. Not such a great prognosis for two other All Blacks, both awaiting results of scans. Jack Good, who hobbled off with a knee injury and propped Joe Moody on the 100th outing for the Crusaders. He could only complete 20 minutes of his milestone match. And look at that, Sam Kane, fresh from surgery, looking very fresh, isn't he, after his peck uh, surgery. So all the best for a speedy recovery to Sam Kane. All right, so we are Japan now. Kiwis abroad, Bowden Barrett. He came off the bench, note off the bench for the Suntory Sun Goliath and snared a hat trick of tries in his 18th minute showing. Yep, three tries in just 18 minutes off the bench against the Kubota Spears. They're unbeaten in their conference, also winning their conference in the Japan top lead. The Robbie Deans coached Panasonic Wild Knights, winning a top seeding and home advantage for their first game in the elimination series. They begin in a fortnight. It's all on, littered with Kiwis, so Bodie's still got the magic, um, but you know what, given his brother's current form, not sure fullback will be something he'll be slotting into. What do you reckon? I'll tell you what, the conversations that Ian Foster and his uh, selecting teams, uh, Grant Fox, going, you know what, where are we going to go? Form of players, he'll be looking at where, the way Geordie's playing. Brotherly level. What are you shaking? Once well, just, so he's shaking his head, he's uh, up and down. What's, I'm just what? saying that he's going to have to get used to that jersey. 
22. 22. Oh, there's no way. Going back to the hurricane? What? There's no way. There's no way. There's Geordie Barrett, and we know his form. You talk about selections. This is something we talked about last week in terms of fullbacks, though, Mills. But, you know, there's a lot of conversations to be had here. We're going to look at some injury. This is a wee injury list at the moment, but the competition is going to heat up, particularly when we've got a few guys coming back from Japan. Mm. Well, he's playing good, isn't he, uh, Geordie? I think he's really taking command. He's owning that that 15 jersey, but to go back to what the JK was mentioning, I think the intensity, that's probably not what Bodie's not, not getting at the moment, so, you know, uh, Geordie at the moment is, um, you know, he's getting that, he's, he's pulling the mileage, and I, I love the leadership role that he's taken on, 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 on himself. Now, that's really um, starting to, to come out of him. I think he's playing great. I mean, I think there's a number of things that you have to consider now. It's never too early to talk about the All Blacks, because we love an All Black chat. But let's have a look at maybe some of the significant injuries that you're talking about and we saw on the weekend. Now, there's conversations that'll have to be made. Sam Kane, Joe Moody, Jack Goodhue, Liam Squire. Why is Falau Whakatava up there? Because his form was so very, very good. And this gets a little bit complicated, Mills for Falau in regards to residency and eligibility and had he been in All Black all of a sudden but rules are going to change. Well he had that stand down period hasn't he because he was born in Tonga uh, and so they extended that out, I mean, it was three years originally but they extended it out this year uh, because of COVID so he had to you know, obviously get selected which I think he would have this year and then, uh, and then play a test match for him but um, if he doesn't uh, by the end of this year then that'll obviously have to wait and be extended out to the five year period which is 2023 and I know it's a big year and I still believe he's capable of doing it but it just means you'll have to wait another couple of years to actually you know, be in the fold. Yeah, and whether or not New Zealand rugby look to challenge this, Ricky, I'll be interested to see. But I want to change the conversation to someone who's not on contract. And it's TJ Piranara, who has gone to Japan. He's now off contract. The fact he was released, and so there's a position now. If he wants to play for the All Blacks this year, he has to return home and play some domestic rugby yeah. before he's eligible. Well, he'd, so he'd have to come. And, look, and I guess the, the issue that we still don't know is because of bloody COVID, we don't know what the schedule's going to look like. So when a, 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 a Sanzo competition's going to get up and running, so does that give TJ time to come back and play for Wellington a couple of games to put himself in the mix if that All Black series is a little bit later? JK's shaking his head. He's a no on the pedal. He's an easy throw to tonight because I tell him he's got something to say. His head's going up and down sideways. But JK, like the question I have for you, you is... can't resign Perrineau. You cannot re-sign him. Oh, but I think in guns in saying that, he's a lot different than what Bodie's done. Bodie's gone out and gone, he's got, you know, as part of his sabbatical, as yeah. part of his contract, he's gone out. TJ Pitanata, he, he had another Took extension. A risk. He could have actually, yeah, and he's taken a risk. He said, look, OK, I don't, I don't want to extend that yeah. last year. I, no, I love the man, don't get me wrong, but who do you want to, who do you want to keep? Well, this is the, the decision-making, though. You, you sit where we are right now with our halfback stocks. The yeah. fact we've just lost possibly the third in form halfback or, you know, a guy who's in that conversation. You've got Brad Weber and Aaron Smith. Are we looking for TJ Perinara to come back in and give us our, our, our insurance? For a year, for two a guys year. Who, who will come back, you talked about uh, Brodie Retallick and Bowden Barrett. Those are two players who will come back to New Zealand and be involved or be available for selection for the All Blacks. That's the big debate here. We start going on the fact that, you know, where does TJ Perron... I, 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 I don't think that's a big b debate. I think when I said Bodie stays in 22, there's no way that the All Black selectors would risk them coming back without knowing the intensity of the Japanese league, right? Right now, if you look at that, you think, well, who was tackling out there? Now, I love the Japanese league, I've, I've played it and I've coached it, it's fantastic. Maybe a game at the end of the season would sort that out. But Bodie has to come back and um, Bodie and Brody have to come back and sit on the bench. You cannot let our guys play through that season while they're away and let them come back and take a test. Why wouldn't you sign TJ? Perinara? Yes. Because I think there's some young guys coming through and for the next World Cup I just think, look, I'd love to sign him, but if it was a case of signing a couple of young guys that are going to get to the next World Cup as good and on further, then I just think he's but going to be a... The next are they, are probably they Mitch there? Drummond, yeah, though. Are they it's, there it's, though? it's probably Mitch back. Drummond or Bryn Hall. Bryn Hall. I mean, here's yeah. the thing about two guys that have performed for the Crusaders consistently and never got that opportunity that maybe they deserved because yeah. there was all this... They're playing behind the Crusaders' pack. Well, I think there's enough to suggest, that, suggest they get a chance. With Fakatava gone now, surely that uh, one gone of those... Where? Two, uh, gone injured, oh, he's injured. Yeah, for yeah, yeah. A, a, I mean season. Yeah, so. we're, we're talking about the World Cup and going forward, right? So, if you think about TJ, he's been a great servant in the game. He's getting the year, twilight of his career, and for me, there's guys who are starting to stack up that are going to give us a, another two World Cups. Now, I'd love TJ should be signed, yeah, but at some stage you've got to go, whoa, 
We well, can't keep everybody. I mean, that's exactly. always the debate, isn't it? Yeah, but the thing is, I mean, if you look at it logistically from his contract point of view, he hasn't got a contract yet. If he comes back and say, and they say, we want you, I'm going to commit instead of going back to Japan, because let's, let's be clear, Japanese money is a lot more than what he's getting, we would, would get. So if he's committed to coming back and he, sh and he signs for a year or two or say, I'm going to lead up to the Rugby World Cup, and he's a lot better than those guys, then why not? You the know, question I, I then have, though, is that... that, that but wouldn't it cost judging three form. times as... Wouldn't, it, wouldn't, wouldn't TJ cost three times as much? That's what I'm saying. As, Probably buy as, two young guys for his price. Well, secure two young guys in yeah. terms of longer-term contracts. You'd have to invest in them, whether it's a Falau Whakatawa coming back from injury. I suggest this then, Ricky. I mean, if we're going to get a gauge on it, why don't we get the winner of the top league in Japan to play the winner of the Trans-Tasman? Mm. The fact, let's get, you want to find out exactly how good that rugby team is, let's, let's get a cross game. Let's find out. In fact, we're looking for contests. We've always wanted to involve Japan. Why not find out then and get a gauge of exactly... Because I think that's the must at the moment, isn't it? Apples with apples. We're I know a number of extra teams yeah. in the Japanese competition. Teams have come from second division up, and there's two pools. It's not quite as strong. But the good teams are very, very good. Everyone's saying that. We need to see proof, right? If I was going to pick on that type of form... I want to see it against top quality players. Absolutely. Club World Cup, you've just started it, there we go. Well, I'd vote for it. But yeah, I mean, I'd vote for it. If some of our great. decision makers at World Rugby and sometimes our NZR weren't so slow moving, maybe we could do it like that. Well, there's a lot of slow moving at the moment because it doesn't appear as though. Uh, oh, Silver Lake's gone done. missing, have they? I haven't oh. heard anything for 10 days. Well, it's, it's, it hasn't advanced. We can't, there's been very little chatter, and that's a concern in itself. And I, I, I pose this to you, Mills, though. What, what this, you know, New Zealand rugby are trying to generate more revenue, <laughs> right? That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to find a place to, to generate more revenue. Is that not the revenue we want to keep these players playing at home rather than having to go to Japan? to secure guys so they're playing in our competition rather than Japan, or we have got to find a way to work with them? Well, I think, you know, obviously when you're talking about $400 million, isn't that part of the investment? The problem that you've got now is that there's, there's very little in what the New Zealand Union or New Zealand uh, Rugby Union actually coming out and saying, NZR, about where that money is going to go. And so, when you, what, 10 days or so? We still haven't had any sort of, you know, that, that would have been the, the time for them to say, well, this is what we would spend our money on. And they still haven't. They're still waiting on what they've gone gone and talked about behind closed doors. But to your point, absolutely, this is where you can actually go. Well, hey, I've got the freedom to go. Well, we're going to we're going to keep these young players and possibly bring TJ Petanara back, as opposed to well, we haven't got money to make to keep these or keep this guy. You know, that's this is where you can invest your money into and and, and have the freedom to be able to do that. But uh, and I get that. And yes, we want want to keep players. And I would would think though the Silver Lake money, the, the thing that I would like about it, is bringing the game up to an entertainment package. We're still really insular and old school a little bit. It's, it's our national game, it's our rugby game. Whereas we're competing in a business, in a massive global business in sport. And I want to see the in-game, the in-stadium experience better for our fans, everything just hyped up a notch. And that's where, for me, that money comes. And if you're creating a, a competition, a, revenue, a package yep. and a revenue, the players are going to want to stay here and be part it. of it. And, and we benefit all benefit from, from it. it. That would be my... It's just a little bit slow moving for yeah. me when I see and I watch it and the, the quality of rugby from not all the contests coming out of Japan, JK, but there are so many names that I see that, that I would love to still come back and be playing here in New Zealand in front of our fans or at least possibly coming and playing a one-off contest, this club <laughs> like competition, a, a local one-off. No, my, my issue is this. We need to expand our game to Japan and we, they need to be part of our competition. Right? If Bodhi wants to stay there and play and then Suntory come down here and get smacked by 60 points, we know that it is a financial sabbatical. But if, he's, if everyone starts playing up there, we're playing across our borders, then I don't see why t sometime tomorrow we can't pick players from our extended competition. So what are we going to do with Moana Pacifica? Uh, are they going to play for who? Right? Yeah. So those decisions, I think, you know, the Silver Lake discussion, the thing that annoys me the most about the Silver Lake decisions is when the NZR wants something and Rob Nichols wants something, they put all this shit out there in the media and then we pick it up and argue about it. Now when we want to know, what's happened? Well, it's gone very quiet right now. And, and this is a concern for us because it's slowing this process. It annoys down. me. I don't know what concerns. It doesn't take a lot, though. JK from But isn't that time. true? Yeah. Like, you know, they both send your Trojan horses out and, they, and instead of working together, which is what annoyed me last week. We would no. like to know whether there's progress, right? We would like to know that we're going. I'd like to know something at least. Yeah. All right. Burn, you've been testing us from week to week. We've pushed it back a little bit to try and test ourselves. JK is going to have another look on his face after this review question, I'm sure. <laughs> you know it's going to go pretty quiet because everyone's going to be going tick, 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 thinking. This is the funnest part of the show. We're the, uh, the funnest part because the, the panel, you know.
particular worried. We witnessed Joe Moody getting his, his ton, his 100 games for the Crusaders yesterday. It was a wonderful, wonderful moment. And our trivia question relates to the ton, all right? You've done a ton, haven't you, Millsy? In Super Games? Super Games, not for one Jeff Goldie, you haven't, have you? you haven't quite no, got the no, ton? No. All right, all right, here it is. Ponder this. Who, who is the first player to notch up 100 games in Super Rugby? Oh. Ouch. First player. So have a think. Have a think at home. Tick tock, tick tock. Meanwhile, um, we talked about Joe Moody getting his ton. Uh, he lost his dad to prostate cancer last year, but his mum, Mary Jane, was on hand for his 100th presentation yesterday. <laughs> Yes, it's a huge day for Joe Moody. Brings up 100 for the Crusaders, but it's a poignant milestone that he will dedicate to his father, Tony, who passed away 10 months ago. Prostate cancer took my dad last year, so uh, just this a little memento um, today for my 100th game. We're auctioning off my jersey, and all proceeds are going towards prostate cancer. And I know your dad, Tony, would be looking down on you today with a lot of pride. So it is my honour to now give this medal to your mum to present to you. Welcome back to the breakdown. I've had bribes. I've had. I've had all sort lunch. Someone's going to buy me lunch if I give them a bit of a hint. I'm not giving hints, but our trivia question is: Which rugby player was the first to notch up 100 games in Super Rugby? I'd like to protest. No, you can't. You protest. It's easier on Mills. You play with it every week. You protest. No, he played with them. It's not my era. It's not my era. It's a Chiefs angle every <laughs> single time. Never. I mean, never, it's never, 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 never. Okay, come on, give us your best I'm shot. Christian Cullen. Wrong. Can I buy a vowel? No, no. you can't. What? <laughs> you can buy me <laughs> lunch. <laughs> I can buy you lunch, though. Uh, hey. Suki, what have you got? I've got absolutely nothing. Okay. No, 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 he's really confident. No, I'm not really confident. You are right. really confident. He's sitting confident. here Chief nodding away. Kevin Mialamu. Is it? Is it Kevin Mialamu? No. No! <laughs> okay, well, I I'll go with another. Game. I'll go with another hooker, right. Anton Oliver. He wasn't the first. Oh! Oh, you know what, though? We could have a wow. protest here. Oh, Because you've blown my bonus question. Ah, oh, so I got, I got the bonus point. You got the, the bonus point. Oh, yes. Okay, yes. The bonus so, Anton Oliver was the first New Zealand player to do it. Oh, that's Therefore, a ridiculous oh. question. I mean, of course it was New Zealand. the first player was... Wasn't a forward. I don't care anymore. Look at this. <laughs> what do you mean, George Gregan? Gregan. Can't can't say it was George Gregan. Well, I was never going to think of George Gregan, was I? First player, 100 games Super Rugby. Oh, but you should have said it. Oh. First Kiwi and Tom Oliver. So it's your era. Is this, this is where so I... So you got I, it right, because I, I, I thought it was a New Zealand-based question. This is where I drop the mic and walk away. I thought it was a New Zealand-based question. Jeff, you won. Hold on, when have you ever seen me bring up George Gregan in anything? True. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't come up in yeah. conversation yeah. other than <laughs> Bitterslow Cup time. And so I'm still not happy about it, even though I got the follow-up question right. That's ridiculous. I just All right, New well, Zealand it, Super it was coming rugby. out of Australia, to be fair, and Australian <laughs> Super Rugby has been outstanding and continues to break new ground, like here in New Zealand. And this is great for us to have Amy Perrett, who has refereed two of those games of Super Rugby. Amy, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Uh, this is new ground, but exciting for you. Look, you've done 100 sevens games. You've played in the biggest stadiums and refed in the biggest stadiums. Um, you've been on the sideline for Super Rugby games. How different has it been for you being out? in the middle, what have you noticed? Um, not, not different at all. Like, um, whatever game I referee, I try to treat it all the same. Um, whether it's a, a women's sevens game uh, or a, a men's super rugby game, I don't want to go into them any, any different. Um, and I just go out to try and enjoy myself, to be honest. Amy, I mean, you're sitting there concentrating on, you know, the the, um, the Olympics in terms of the sevens, the techni technical side of it, and then now you're all of a sudden shoved into the 15 um, uh, side. How do you get your mind around sort of the, the, the technicalities, especially around the breakup because uh, the breakdown, because it's it's such a different area. 
Oh, it's definitely really challenging um, going between the two. As you said, sevens can be really, really technical um, in, in black and white, whereas 15s, you kind of want to let it flow and allow continuity. So um, my biggest focus when I'm trying to come back into the 15s arena is just getting what's important, um, letting the game breathe. Um, otherwise, it's really easy to blow a 1,000 penalties um, coming back from sevens. Amy, congratulations on everything you've achieved. I, I wonder how you cope with the scrutiny that does come with being a first, um, doing something different for the first time and standing out a little bit in a crowd. Do you consciously sort of take yourself away from some of the chatter around it or how do you deal with that side of things? Yeah, definitely. I, I try to stay under the radar where I can. Obviously, um, being the first female to do something in your sport uh, doesn't always allow that. Um, but, yeah, as you said, I just try to, to keep my head down, um, keep the noise out. And, you know, I, I referee well when I'm just having a good time um, and enjoying myself. And, you know, if I think about too much about the pressure I put on me, um, then then I'll overthink things and, and probably not do a very good job. So similar to probably what, how the players go about it, just, you know, know what you've got to do uh, and just focus on that. Amy, what, when you said you like to let the game breathe, what does that mean when you're on the field? Do you just ref the rules that you want or think are the best for the game? What does it breathe mean? For me, it means making relevant decisions. Um, I mean, at every breakdown, a referee could probably find a penalty, um, but it's, it's about getting the ones that are really important to the game uh, and to set the game up so the players know what they can and can't do. Um, and then, you know, have those boundaries set so then they know where you stand and hopefully from there you can get some good flow and, and good continuity, if that Amy, makes sense. Amy, sorry, I'll, I'll go back to, you know, the Olympics. You know, you've had a taste of it now with 15s. You know, there's a bubble possibly opening up between ourselves. I mean, do you, do you still concentrate on the 15 game or do you, do you just say, look, hey, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go after this, uh, this Olympics? Um, for my whole career, I've really been juggling the both, so I I'm not too worried about it. Um, for me, I just want to take every opportunity available. Um, I don't want to restrict myself to, to one form of the game or the other. Um, so I'm really open to, to do both. If I can get to the Olympics, that's, that'll be fantastic. If I get to, to referee in the Trans-Tasman, that will also be fantastic. So I just want to just be available to whatever opportunity presents itself and, and work on it from there. So, Amy, that... Uh, opportunity may be one of the New Zealand teams and we're really hoping that happens because it, it's, it'll be great for everyone to, to see that opportunity, to get that chance. Are you expecting it maybe to be just that slightly little bit different than what you're experiencing in Australia? Yeah, it's a different crowd. I mean, in, in Australian rugby, I've been around for a long time and um, I guess uh, it's um, a, a more familiar thing to see someone like myself on the field, uh, even though I've only done two Super Rugby games um, you know, there is that familiarity there, whereas um, coming into a trans-Tasman competition with New Zealand teams, it's a little bit unknown, um, a different style of rugby as well. So uh, it's exciting, though, um, if there is that opportunity. But, yeah, there's just there's probably just a little bit of unknown. What sort of time commitment do you put in, Amy, in, in terms of your prep? Will, will you scout those teams? I know you've got a little baby as well. We, you had the baby and came back to refereeing. Um, you, you're juggling a few balls. Yeah, definitely, especially this year because I started doing um, some work in Rugby Australia with uh, the community referees, so now it's almost like three three jobs at once, but that's OK. Uh, I've learnt to kind of juggle that. Uh, but, yeah, no, that's similar to what the players would do, I guess. You know, you, you do review what the teams kind of, um, how they play, the style of play, where their strengths are, their weaknesses, what kind of things you might expect in a game, um, and that's how I, I start formulating my preparation um, for the weekend. Uh, so, yeah, and then again, like you said, juggling that in with, with the sun and, um, and, and community ref work uh, is difficult, but I'm managing it at the moment. Making a decision in the middle of the field, if you were now Bill Beaumont in charge of the <laughs> what rule would you change or what would you get rid of? Uh, for me, I find the mall is the hardest thing to referee. Um, I don't know what I'd change about it, <laughs> to be honest, uh, but just some way to, to make it um, simpler for the teams to be able to defend um, and just for the referees to be able to, to, to referee it a bit easier so it's, uh, it makes a bit more sense. 
Perfect answer, Amy. JK does that to everybody. <laughs> Out of the blue, left field. But I tell you what, uh, thank you for coming on the breakdown tonight. Good luck. We are looking forward to seeing you back out there once again and all the great work you're doing. Cheers. Thanks for joining us. No worries. Thanks for having me. Awesome. It's always you and your laws, JK. Oh. Always you oh, and your laws. Look, we've got stuff to give away. We've got tickets to give away on the weekend. A couple of fantastic games down the Highlanders. They are taking on the Blues. That is down in Dunedin. And then it happens in Hamilton. It's the Chiefs. They are hosting the Crusaders. There's plenty to look forward to. We've got six tickets as well. And you've got to email us here as well. If you want to be part of New Zealand Rugby World, that's what we're giving away. And you have to give us the answer to tonight's question, which was about who was the first person to play 100 games of Super Rugby. It came from left field, it came from the wrong side of the Tasman, but that's okay. Email us there on the breakdown at sky.co.nz. And we'll go to the tipping boards. Oh, what sort of week you... J oh, JK's head's up. Oh, oh. Burn. Oh, uh, did someone do picks for you? Yeah, or what? did someone you did... Well, oh, did you, did you harsh, luck it? Well, the Blues, <laughs> uh, the Blues didn't play, so he had no idea what he was doing. <laughs> hey, anyway, where are we? What's so, happening? So I think for viewer entertainment, um, I get to do these each week, really, the old tipping and how everyone's going. I think I'm back in the top ten, just quietly. Let's have a look and see how we're all faring with the Sky Tipping competition. Ah, Millsy... What have you done? So he's even surprised. Yeah, but you must have backed the Chiefs for a change. Yeah. Hey, okay. oh, silly so look at that. You're sitting high and dry up there. Um, I'm, I was beating the stats geek, Tumbai. He's climbed up, so I don't know what's going on there. Three, Josh Iwani right. slots that, and I'm... Let's have a look at the wider Fano, shall we? Let's have a look at the, the Sky talent. Oh, leader. yeah. Look at that. Kirsty is smashing. Get it, girl. Still. Hey, I'm Tumbai. Yeah, oh. Look at that. Look at that. I'm quite happy I'm like, hey, ahead of JK, scoreboard pressure. Kelly and Dagger. I'm just happy with that. Scoreboard pressure. I might look like not much, but I'm on 11 points. If I was the Crusaders, I'd be nervous about the Blues, and if I was you guys, I'd be nervous I'm coming back. Oh, you're coming back. Are I you serious? Back. You're coming back. back. I tell you, he's made oh, the big move. It's tipped by Matson. Tess has made a massive comeback. We shouldn't forget the Trans Tasman competition as well. Thanks very much, Bernie, as always, to John Kerwin. Welcome, Ricky. Thanks, Anthony. We didn't see your name on there, though. I had another perfect weekend on the tip. <laughs> oh, I'll just leave <laughs> it be at a that. zero. Thanks, Mills. Look, we're going to do it all again, and JK will be in a good mood as always. In seven days' time here on The Breakdown. See you next week. A huge day for Joe Moody. Love Murphy is there, charging for the line. And it's down the short side through Lynchings. He's got Dixon, it's a pretty one meter. George Bridge stepping. Frizzell, back inside to Smith. Savia hitting for the line, he's in. Savia right over the top of Brent Hall. for the Crusaders. McKenzie strikes it.